<laughs> this fucking stupid camera. You spend five hundred dollars on a fucking camera, and it's like it's got buffer on it. <laughs> it's buffering. Yeah, cool, great. Maybe I'll take some fucking pictures with it that are probably better on a phone anyway. Jacket Off Podcast, episode 62. Sorry, it's not 69. We'll get there hopefully by the end of next year. We'll be at 69. <laughs> at the rate we're going, it might take two years for us to get to that magical number 69. Uh, by the way, I have an air conditioner going. Does it sound like I have an air conditioner going? You No, I can't hear you, but I, I know mine definitely does. So, But you can only hear it when I talk because I put a gate on it. So when I talk, you hear a little... That's what I was noticing earlier. I was like, what the hell is that? When he's talking, it sounds like the room, but it's also not... Yeah, I don't know why Discord was gating it, but whatever. I think it just naturally um, has a gate. It must. Yeah, I'm sure it's just like Skype or whatever that has like all that background canceling shit kind of in, in place anyway. Well, guess what? It's 95 degrees outside. Not turning off the Dude, I'm not. Dude, audio quality? Kiss fuck my ass. that. Get out of my face. My truly is developing sweat in a room where I have the door closed and this air conditioner has been running nonstop. Like, it's just around the clock this thing's going. Uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with poor ventilation in, in here. Probably. Uh, I'm probably just breathing in Freon hey, all the time. As long as it's chilly, boy. Mm-hmm. Guy have that meat locker. 57,000 BTUs of cold generating power. Coursing through my... Dude, I w Becky went out. I made this bomb-ass salad for lunch. I made a super bougie salad because I got like a whole crate full of fucking vegetables from Misfit Market, mm -hmm. which, which I realize is already a bougie sentence just saying that in general. Well, Misfit but then, Market makes it sound like you're getting bunk ass vegetables. You you do, but actually, you get them less than you think. The uh the one that I got before was Imperfect Foods. Yeah, yeah, that's the good. That stuff. was the one where you'd get some peanut like a you like a zucchini shaped like a penis, and so like it, it was about fifty fifty. Most of the time, it was like you would get probably eighty percent normal vegetables but then you get a sweet potato that looks like an ass which is actually great for their thing because you could put it on instagram and be like oh, you know my carrot looks like a dick you know and then that's like free marketing for them yeah but they, with they misfits revel, market they revel in the dick -shaped <laughs> they're like dude as many titty shaped tomatoes as you can put in this bin do the ugliest ones you can find uh I like the idea of it, first of all, because it's a shitload of vegetables for, like, no money. Um, I think I pay, like, $25 or 30 bucks every two weeks to get this giant crate of vegetables that I can't even, like, get through. Like, I end up just one day out of the whole, like, when I get it, I end up just cooking a, a ton of shit. Just, like... What can I put all these vegetables like a I'm making a vegetable ragu <laughs> weekly stew. <laughs> so it's like I'm in an army barracks and it's like we got to fucking get all this shit before it goes bad. So I just cram it into everything. I have a whole bag in my freezer of frozen fucking like fruits because I got like crates of like blueberries and strawberries and blackberries and I got a pineapple and all of this shit. And so I just quickly chopped through everything, put it in a Ziploc bag, flattened it out, put it in the freezer. And now it's like I'll put it in a cocktail or I'll grind it up into something. It's go. the only way I can get rid of this shit. So anyways, I made this bougie like ass salad. <laughs> so you could, <laughs> yeah, you, dude. You could do like quick smoothies in it. I, I have a fucking um, I have a ninja blender that came with my coffee maker. But in the move, when we moved, I lost all of the cups. 
the blender cups, the last, they're all gone. I have the blade and the base. That's it. Oh, and so I got now I got to get the, all the blender cups again. Um, but anyway, that would be great. Uh, I this one today I or yesterday I got it was beets. I got beets in it. Just hell yeah, dude! Some goddamn beets. Beets are delicious. So what I did was cook them in vinegar. I did them in lemon juice, but um, I. Got apples, too. So what I did was I chopped everything super, super thin. Like, it was almost like little, like, uh... Chips? Uh, no, uh... Shoestrings. So, like, everything was, like, julienne, like, super almost. And then I did the apples and the beets that way. And then I hit I hit them in a pan, like, really hot. Mm -hmm. Just kept turning them, turning them, turning them, turning them. Salt, pepper, lemon juice. And then I made a, uh salad and i put some goat cheese on it and uh fucking almonds cucumbers you if, dude it's like having afternoon brunch but anyways what led me into this train of thought was you saying that it's so fucking hot outside i in the difference between inside and outside is i went outside i sweat through this salad like i've never I've never felt like I had the meat sweats eating a salad. It's like you'd figure, oh, so crisp and refreshing. But I'm sitting out on my porch just trying to muscle through it. And I'm like, sweat, sweat. So I it finished the salad and I walk back inside. And it was like a, it was like a fucking peppermint, pa- York's peppermint patty, like on top of a mountain. You felt the rush of fucking cold air come into the, oh, it's invigorating. It's beautiful. Fuck, beautiful man, dude. I lo- there is nothing better than the relief you feel when, especially like it, maybe if you're not even at your house, if you're out in the world, and it's like it's so fucking hot, and then you're just like, all right, I can't stand this anymore. I'm gonna go into whatever store, and then you go in, and those sliding doors open, and it's a fucking blast right into your face. You can't buy that. That's, I mean, you could. that's for free. You, I mean, you could. Um, It'd be pointless having sliding doors at your house, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I feel like going out into the world now, speaking of that, is so fucking stupid. Like, I've never felt a more like sense of fucking righteous indignation just walking out into the populace than I have like over the past few weeks. And you know, fucking nobody wants this to be the coronavirus podcast. I get it. However, so far it's, that's what it's been every time we record it. So it's why, okay. Why, Look, why it's a chronicling. It it's a chronicling of what's going on through the lens of somebody who's pissed off. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Look, everybody is. You gotta search real hard to find this. Oh my god. What an asshole. I'm just saying to you, as this podcast is my form of very inconsistent therapy, <laughs> that I fucking can't stand the weird conspiracy theory shit that continues to happen. It felt like at least when we did this a month ago, like if we, you know, the last time we did this, it felt like that shit was kind of like, you know, kind of at the bottom of the barrel. You know what I mean? The, the, the cream had risen to the top, so to speak. And then now, since then, the past few weeks, I've just been seeing the most like, have you ever seen All Gas No Breaks? Oh, is it a movie? No, it's a um <laughs> what's your guy that you like that goes out to cons and interviews people? Joe Joe goes? Yeah, I Joe guess. something? Yeah, I haven't watched I haven't seen those in like I don't Well, no, this is that's why I'm saying is is All Gas No Breaks is the new version of that, but it's not cons. 
it's a guy who goes out to like areas that are famously fucked up. So like he, um, the most recent one was a 4th of July party in Maryland. And the guy goes out in like a full on suit to the beach. He wears a suit like every time. Mm -hmm. And all he does, he barely says a fucking word. All he does is shove a microphone into people's face and just let them go off. And the most recent one that he did was the most representative of this in our age bracket and below that I've ever seen. Like, his whole concept behind these videos is to not like normally on a like a like a daytime talk show or not a daytime but like a uh what do you call um fucking jimmy kimmel's and all of those like late night t- uh, talk late, shows so, yeah. late night talk show yeah the opposite of the other one the other one <laughs> you know, so they have midday the talk show in the morning but i'm not talking there's talk about shows all ones. the time i'm not talking about those ones in the morning that's not the kind i thought uh where they have like the guy on the street segment where he goes out, but he kind of tries to bait people. You yeah. know what I mean? Like tries to kind of structure the conversation to head a certain way or to make them look stupid. This guy does nothing to influence these people's responses because you're literally watching an edited cut of him again, just shoving a microphone into some stupid asshole's face. And letting them scream in it forever. And this Maryland one with all these dudes out on the beach was. I've I've never. It's so fucking out of control, dude. I, I'm going to quote one of the guys. He goes up to this group. And, and honestly, you can't throw a cat without hitting somebody in a group like. This speech is fucking packed with people with no mask on. Nobody's got a fucking mask on. He goes up to this one group and he goes, he goes, so, uh, so what are you guys out here to do? And he's like, we're out here to fucking party. Like he's, you know, the normal bro guy. <clears throat> There's a girl standing next to him. And he goes, he goes, yo, dude, I'm all, this is what I'm all about. I'm all about bad bitches. Now, meanwhile, now I just want to describe what this guy looks like. He's as fat as I am. And fucking, you know, beer gut hanging out. And he's probably like 26. He's got the worst fucking like neck beard hair, like comb over type shit, like premature, premature balding type thing going on. And this girl standing next to him. Now, she's not unattractive. She's attractive, right? Mm -hmm. Regular old run of the mill bikini attractive. He goes, I'm all about three things. Bad bitches, cocaine, and truly. (laughs) And so she and then the camera pans in on her face and she's like has this completely like indignant look on her face like uh like what the fuck did he just say he repeats it fucking like two other times but then in between him saying that the guy the interviewer and actually i think funnily enough i think his name is andrew (laughs) the interviewer goes to the girl now Mm -hmm. and he's like um he, I think he asked her the same question and then he's still rambling on like going on, carrying on, carrying on. And he, he asks him who this is. Like, he's like, I don't know if he was like, is this your girlfriend or is this, you know, whatever he's like, yeah, this, this one of my bad bitches right here. Like we're like real good friends. Uh, and, and then he points and he's like, is he your real good friend? And she's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're good friends. He and he's like, yo, pain. And then he goes, then he goes, yo, I ate her ass out like five times. <laughs> and then the girl goes, and then the girl goes, Darren. <laughs> like in the tone of like, where you absolutely know that he did it. And yeah. that she's embarrassed. Yep. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. <laughs> 
I found it. I found the most recent one on a Reddit thread. I had watched his other videos before, and one of the first comments was like, "Yo, the way that girl said that shit was like the most telling thing of the whole video." So, oh, Darren, why do I think I saw that somewhere? Uh, <laughs> he he um he's gone viral somewhat. Okay, maybe uh, maybe someone someone uh, busted out that part. He's got um I his think, his I think I've seen that part like in a, like a gift form. Yeah. <laughs> like his Andrew Callahan is the guy's name. Mm-hmm. And like he goes to the coolest fucking ones. Like he goes to Talladega Super Speedway. Okay. It's one of his most popular videos. 4th of July at uh, that Michigan one. Yep. He does these interviews with these dudes in Florida that are absolute batshit insane. He's gone to a bunch of coronavirus lockdown protests and interviewed people. He went to the AVN Expo. That would be probably the only one that was more like a Joe Goes. He went to Midwest Fur Fest and uh, AVN. Okay. Uh, And a Flat Earth Conference, which was... I can imagine. Good shit dude it's the guy makes great fucking videos but anyway That's enough of promoting mind. somebody else's fucking shit <laughs> but i can't recommend it enough uh okay i got it's, a, i got a real question for you a real go. real question okay so you know when you your like taste buds start to change right and you start to get a taste for something that happened to me i used to think hummus was disgusting yes now i really like it don't know why, but that's not. The How best. did it come into your life? I know it's. I've, I all. It's always been in the fridge. You know. Does your I mean? mom eat it? Yeah, she always eats eats it. So, so, at one point, I, just, I just gave it a try. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm kind of digging that. I mean, and in fairness, I would feel like your mom would probably buy the most accessible flavors of hummus versus just something that would be like the normal everyday run of the mill one. So it's like spinach and artichoke hummus this is a fucking spinach and artichoke dip how bad could it be well that's besides the, but the, the point i'm trying to make here is so how come first of all that's sub sam samba is that the brand with the red top uh sabra sabra first of all they're supremely spicy isn't even a little spicy so don't fall for that shit because well to you <laughs> no I, to anybody I could taste when something's oh like Frank's Red Hot is spicy, right? You can I get taste what you mean. The spice in it, yeah. You can't even taste. It doesn't even taste spicy. That's one. That's bullshit. Don't fall for it. Because I was at the Walmart, and they had. I gotta have the spicy one. They had a Walmart pepper one, but they had this one that said supremely spicy. And first of all, Walmart is like two bucks for a thing of it. And it tastes the exact same. It's the fucking four dollar one. So if you're at the Walmart, go for the great value fucking <laughs> hummus. It's not, okay. It's not even great value. It's like their marketplace. Yeah, they got whatever. a whole mid range shit going yeah, on it's, now it's with one, all that it, stuff. It's one of those things. But yeah, if you're at the, so, my real complaint is why did they say it's like garlic or pepper flavored, but all they do is just. Take a scoop of garlic and throw it in the middle. What? Mm. What? what, what what's that the is with a. That? That's a cultural thing. Is it? Yeah. So when hummus is made normally, it's typically done where you have the one giant thing of hummus in the middle of the table. Uh huh. Because in Turkish and Mediterranean, you know, style cooking it's all done largely like family style so so then you almost have like a like a tray of different minced things that you kind of dip the hummus and then you dip it in that or you put a little spoon of garlic on it or something very similar to how a chutney would be in indian culture where it's like a chutney isn't necessarily just a sauce it's actually a giant tray of shit that comes in where it's like a thousand sauces and like all different kinds of like condiments and whatnot the same thing applies to 
Mediterranean. So it's basically on every single table in a Mediterranean household is fucking um, pepper flakes and gar- minced. It would be all that. Right? A giant tub of hummus, a big brick of feta, a bunch of cucumber sliced up, like just with and and, li- and the cucumber sliced up, but would literally just have like olive oil and lemon juice on it, mm-hmm. and like salt and pepper. That's it. And then everything is kind of just laid out around that. So it's just fifteen thousand things of pita, big ass bowl of hummus, condiments, feta cheese, and that's how you kind of build the rest of it. And they the way they eat is essentially if you have a big like fish like a branzino or some shit like that like just some big ass head on whole fish that's usually another thing that's kind of mediterranean Mm -hmm. you just take your big ass scoop of fish you take your scoop of hummus you basically make yourself like a pita sandwich and you use the pita to eat like you use it as a pocket to just pick up shit and you just not only i mean you can make it like that but also you just literally use it as a glove to pick up shit like you just take the pita a little piece of it you g- grab a huge chunk of shit on your plate in between the pita and just inhale that. So what you're saying is, so when you get those containers, you're supposed to scoop the outside and then get a little bit from the inside. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and you can stir it completely in. I don't think there's any, that's the other thing. I really hate when people get precious about shit. Like, you know how precious people get about sushi? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever seen where it's like, it's someone's like, it, it, let's say it's like a piece of sushi, but it's the kind where you have the fish on top of it. So it's like it's it's not a roll. It's um, nigiri sushi. So which is just the little packed in rice and then the fish on top. People get precious about that. Like if someone gets their little plate that they get at the fucking sushi place and they put their soy sauce in it and then they mix in some wasabi Already, you've got fucking 50% of America's population pissed off that you mixed wasabi in with your fucking soy sauce. And then additionally, if you don't take your sushi and dip it in fish side first and kind of swipe it through the soy sauce, fucking forget it, man. You're an idiot. You're, you're, you're a fucking loser. You should rice, never eat sushi ever the again. Rice soaks up the, the soy sauce. Now, that's what they're going to tell you and and look i don't i don't disagree with that concept but what they'll tell you is that the having so much what? soy sauce no, the, uh, is going to ruin the taste of the fish oh well no i was saying that as a good thing that's you though that's mr salt <laughs> let's get that salt in there bud come on let's get some sriracha let's okay, mix it with so, some mayo let's get some boom boom sauce going so the baby prob- so the problem with the hummus is I ended up eating all the pepper in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now I got plain ass hummus. Left. You know how many people do that shit, man? Like, it's one of those uh, things. It was also because it was supposed to be supremely spicy, but it wasn't at all. So I'm trying to get like scoops of pepper. Like, let's get the spicy. Can on. we get some spice going in this beast? Look, if you want to be a real fucking boss, dude. You got those pepper plants going outside. Oh, I was thinking about it. I was looking up some hummus recipes. Oh, it's so fucking easy. Dude, olive oil, tahini, chickpeas, fucking your peppers. Yeah. I, was I mean, doing you like cook your peppers garlic, down. Garlic reaper hummus. Mm-hmm. And it don't got to be nothing crazy. It's just cans of chickpeas. It's like rinse them. No, no, if I, I gotta get fancy stuff. Fancy chickpeas if I'm gonna fucking... Oh, like you go for a bag and soak them and do all that shit? Oh, yeah, if I'm, if I'm using my special peppers for my special plant that I grew in. I agree with you. Use top shelf. I agree with you. Uh, yeah, you go over to Shinatri's and get yourself some tahini. That's not a very common... Uh, it's not a very common ingredient. You're not gonna... F- I mean... I think actually they do have it in most grocery stores now in the uh, kosher for Passover section. What is it? Tahini is um, sesame butter. It's basically if you made peanut butter out of sesame seeds, toasted sesame seeds. It's like it's fucking super dense. Um, 
and it's what makes hummus have that nutty flavor going on. Without that, it would taste like real weird, like alkaline. Oh, I was seeing like chickpeas pine are nuts. very. Pine nuts are typically the. Was that, is it that instead? Or? Are the topper? No, the pine nuts don't blend into it. The pine nuts would be the traditional thing that you put in the center, like you would find. The only reason why you don't find that at the store is because pine nuts are fifty thousand dollars. They're extremely oh, expensive. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. They uh, when I worked in the produce department, uh, that's where they kept them, and they were like ten bucks for like a little tiny container. Oh, dude, it's crazy. Um, yeah, most of most of the traditional setups are. You like in Mediterranean, you would make the hummus. You would you you'd put the little pool in the center. You would sprinkle the pine nuts on. You put garlic in the center. You'd squeeze a lemon over the top of it, and you do a little bit of olive oil back over the top, and that's your traditional setup for a plate of hummus. That's like the normal way. The way that they did it. That's up at the. Uh, I don't know if it's still there, but in near uh, Utica College, there's this place called the Phoenician. That does like fucking bomb ass Mediterranean food. I fucking hate this thing. I'm getting it out of my way. Um, that that place is really good. Um, where, where is it? Right up where where you're heading towards Utica College. Yeah. And there's that. I think the Friendlies is up there. Yep. Like you know where I'm talking yeah. right in there. First on road. There's a there's an Indian place that's right down that road that's called that's that's near the IHOP. It's coming up from the IHOP. Okay, so it's called Minar. There's the it's right on the corner. Yeah. And then the Phoenician used to be right near that. I don't know if it's still there anymore, but that's like a traditional Lebanese restaurant. Uh, if you want to have a coffee that you think you would be able to handle and this is a this is dylan talking uh this is 300 milligram dylan if you want to have a coffee that will change the way you think about your absorption of caffeine uh they have a a turkish coffee that's like syrup um becky and i got it at the end of our dinner one time with like some ice cream and mm -hmm. I felt like I was going to die. It is still there, like, by the way. Is it? Yes. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, that place is very good. Minar's good, too. That's really good Indian food. Have you ever even... Have, uh, do, what's... Is that even a thing for you? What? Indian food? I've had it once. Was... Did it... I liked it. I just... I don't know. I just never had it again. Huh. I had the, uh, the basic, like, curry bowl with the noodles... And yeah, stuff. I had one of those. Yeah, at, at the uh, there's a place in Syracuse. I don't think it's still there anymore. What about Thai food? Thai. All right, I'm gonna be honest. I might have had Thai or Indian. I can't remember which one it was. Well, so typically the, when you they're, said noodles, they're very similar, right? Mm, well, or is Indian any, food. The curry that we think about when we think about Indian food is sauce based. Yeah. So like maybe it it's was... very saucy. Thai food and Vietnamese food are centered around noodles. Vietnamese is ramen and pho. And then Thai food is pad thai, which is flat noodles. Uh-huh. And um Vietnamese has a lot of like lemongrass and like brighter type of shit going on. Um, a lot of tamarind, like a orangey, orangey type flavors. Okay. There's key, I mean, there's pretty key differences between. I'm pretty sure it was Thai. Mm. Now so you I had a that. noodle bowl. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Like that's a peanut, what... peanut sauce. That's another thing that's uh, no, very endemic is, of Thai food. Uh, very spicy. One I had, uh, it was a curry one. <coughs> I think I'm looking at. Oh, that. like a like a red curry. Yeah, that's the other thing. Is what's funny about Thai versus Vietnamese versus Indian food is that the curries that we're all talking about, a lot of people just think curry is an Indian food. Curry itself is actually just a food concept. It's like, um. Curry is the same as grilling. 
Like, I can have a grilled zucchini or I can have a curried zucchini. It's like a it's like a thing that happens all over the world. Like the the curry. Mm -hmm. It's just as common as any other thing that we do to food. But most people think it's only Indian food. But um, I feel like I've had. Like an Indian spice type thing in, in, in Indian. Yeah. It's mostly what makes Indian food the way that it is and what kind of get like the first time I ever had it was here. Oh. oh, you're freezing up. Freezing up. Your face is frozen. Did it cut out? There you go. Oh, back. damn it. Back. We're back. Anyway. Um, so yeah, curries. Yeah. They're good. And uh, we should have more of them. Should bring you around. Hold up. My Fuck internet. This. My internet God damn it. shut off. And then came back on real quick. I don't know what the hell that was about. All right, we're good. <laughs> it just shut off like, completely. Oh, no. Oh, it's there catching up a little bit. It's Spectrum's but... being a piece of shit right now. It's like literally full on Spectrum dropping. Ooh. Yeah, because my because I'm la landlined right now and it's saying no internet connection. Ooh, nice. All right, let's see if it studies out. Thanks, Spectrum. All America's right. greatest internet company. All right, it's better. All right. All right. <laughs> What are you saying? We should. Uh, we should get some curries. Yeah. We should, you, should, you should come up. We should go. And I was telling you about this place, Saigon Spring. It's a Vietnamese place. You get a bowl of ramen that's bigger than your head for like $13. Not the biggest ramen guy because there was a reason. It, it was. Re oh, the egg. That Okay, I like ramen. I just don't like the egg in it. I don't no, like you don't have to have that. Actually, the you know, the egg is actually really not that common in Japanese. Vietnamese ramen. Yeah, Japanese is where the egg yeah. is. Not, um, not like I went to a legitimate, I mean, uh, like a I had it at the casino. Yeah. Which, They're going to put an egg in it because that's kind of the way that... Yeah, it was like a, it was, but it was, a, it was considered a Japanese style ramen because they yeah. sold sake there and everything. The, uh, the Vietnamese one is actually more focused on actually it's more focused on the sides, the little condiments. So like yeah. when you get when you get a bowl of pho or you get a bowl of ramen, um, like a bowl of pho is like your giant ass bowl with the noodles and the meat, mm -hmm. and then the vegetables are all raw on the sides. So you get like crunchy shit like bamboo shoots and. Um, bamboo, shoot. bamboo shoots and water chestnuts are two of my favorite uh, things. You get that, and then you get like Thai or um, uh, you get basil, like um, Thai basil, and you kind of ruffle that up and throw that in there, and then they give you like a bunch of different chili oils and um, hoisin sauce. <laughs> and so that all you kind of stir all that into your shit as you want it kind of um and like i said the the size of these fucking bowls of fuzz is huge like you get uh and every person that i've ever brought there is has loved it um even if they weren't really familiar with it like in general there's like a noodle bowl that anybody would really like it's like oh what is it it's literally a beef noodle bowl like yeah. Do you like beef? Do you like steak? Like, do you like noodles? Do you like broth? Beef. Uh, you're you're gonna be good. Like, you're fine. Um. <clears throat> now I'm hungry. Hey, I just wanted to know what was up with the, the center dollop of. <laughs> That's how we got here. Garlic was like, what the fuck is hummus. that? And then suddenly I went on into a Bourdain esque exploration of what makes the food the way that it is. 
Oh, Somebody knocking at me? Hello. Is food here? <laughs> That's so funny. Becky ordered food and now it's here. All right. We can break this uh, if you want. I'll just cut it together. You want to break it in half? Yeah. And away we go. So, uh, funnily enough, the food that so interrupted me in the first segment of the podcast was Thai food. <laughs> so, did you know I'll give it was you, Thai food? Uh, I we I kind of left it up to Becky somewhat, but I knew that it it, it was one of the possibilities. He was either going to be that, or it was going to be Vietnamese, or it was going to be uh, Indian. So it was like one of those. Right on, right on, right on. Yeah. It's the only ones that come over in the DoorDash. Oh. And now I just got to pick my teeth on the podcast. Disgusting. Sounds really good. It's very... I mean, you don't have to. There's also I mean, option. You know. Could. When you get some... When you get some herbage in your teeth, it's, you know, it's tough. It's tough to get out of there. Um, so. I had... <laughs> some uh basil chicken thing with rice and uh a soup with braised pork ribs in it that was very good and then some dumplings and a couple spring rolls and Damn. some cheese wontons jesus just a smorgasbord we always do a smorgasbord but you gotta and you eat it for lunch the next day so you have a little bit, of, you have a little bitty bite of everything, then you leave it for the next day. But, uh, you know, life goes on. Anyway, now that I have the meat sweats uh, in a frigid, cold environment, which can't possibly explain the, uh, the strangeness that that is, a cold, clammy, AC-assisted sweat uh, that's... Just wonderful. So beautiful. Mm, it feels really, really great. Well, here we are. I'm unprepared. I don't know. Let's Dylan, let's let's make a new segment. Okay. How about we make a segment? Let's do like um What do you got? Let's let's do like uh let me just look through some fucking like stupid news sites or some shit, and okay. we'll try to spin it off. I got okay. Let's try my segment first. All right, go for it. Okay, it's Please. called. How have you not seen that yet? Oh, oh da, da. wow. Okay, that's how it goes. Da, 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 okay. da, da, da. So, so have you watched anything recently? Or in, ingested anything recently that you haven't before? That there's, it's almost like impossible that you haven't at this point. Yes. Well, okay. okay. So I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm pretty sure I talked about it before. This was a really long time ago. So I think let's condense this to like over the course of the of our of the backstreet boys reunion tour which is you know the code word for pandemic um what we you know what what i've seen where it was like yeah you know what i'm gonna finally watch that that's kind of the idea yeah yeah, yeah. and i'm seen, pretty heard, sure uh go. seen heard read played yes you know xyz mm -hmm. media consumption yeah all right there's a few things under that neat that um, umbrella so, I'm pretty sure I talked about it on here before, but it's probably worth spinning up a yarn again because I did really enjoy it so much. Was Lost Boys? Yeah, um, I don't know that you talked about. It. I think did, I did. About, I, I, think I we might have just talked before, about it off air. It was no, I think it was the the uh, 
the idea came up that you should watch it. Yeah. yeah I think oh, and, you referenced and, it for some reason. And then I did reference it. It was with a coworker that were that, that I actually referenced it. And then I was like, I should watch yeah, that. Yeah. I had one of those moments where it's like, it's the same thing as like, should I really buy that t-shirt if I haven't seen the movie? It's like the, I, the same idea. It's like, should I really make that reference if I've never seen the movie before? Uh, so sat down and watched it. Turns out it's a kitschy masterpiece of cinema. Um, and if you take it a- as what it is, you'll actually be very surprised. I think that's the, the key takeaway for me is I went into it thinking that it was going to be some uh, piece of shit schlock uh, thing, right? Uh, it has uh, to be. Uh, I mean, no, I've never heard that about that movie, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I would just, I just I don't assume know where you got that, that no, idea. All- all that I knew about the movie was like vampires, t- t- teen it's vampire bike year yeah. street bike talks, gang, street, and yeah, I was like, gang, "Oh, vampires. this is gonna be this is gonna be like what I I really went into it knowing that like okay, this is probably a very like nostalgic and referential piece of movie, and it's there's a lot of reference that are, that it's made to it." So I kind of kept that in mind, thinking that like, oh, people must reference this movie because it's again a joke. Street tough vampire pretty boys. They reference it because it's a joke, not because it's good. That's what I had thought. Like I would always be, and also you know you have the um, the Corey Feldman problem, where it's like if Corey Feldman's in the movie, can it really be a good movie? Like, do we know if it is or not? Goonies, especially in that. Well, that's Goonies is early. I'm saying in the Feldman era of like where he's starting to like try I, to to be fair, do I think, something. I think this was the the movie that made him the way he was. Yeah. Like he, they gave him a style, and then he just never. He's yeah. on stage at the Late Show with angel winged ladies singing about some fucking. I don't even remember what the song was. It just. That it was like some like straight up like believe in yourself uh 80s yeah, stuff. That performance was it was almost like a sequel to this movie. <laughs> like where Very are they so. oh, where are they now? Well, I could show you where Corey Feldman is now and um he is a shell of his former self, oh, a thought, person who I mean, could have started the Me Too movement if he actually was taken seriously. What Wasn't he the guy that you're talking about on the beach saying only about three things bad bitches, cocaine, and truly. Like, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't that Corey Feldman? I, I Wait, you it's said on the video, was I was just like, Jesus Christ, I didn't know Corey Feldman was from Michigan. Uh, yep, Corey Feldman, bad bitches, truly, and cocaine. Uh, the three T's. I have a three on his shopping list. It was a really, it's a really good movie, and the only reason why it's a good movie is because it's very stylistically identifiable. You have very much a, it's a quality of filmmaking that doesn't, that's kind of hard to capture now. Like it's, a lot of people try to do it like unironically now, capture like the 80s style of filmmaking. It's like making a comeback with your, you know, your Panos Cosmatos and, you know, all that shit, like kind of the horror, horror 80s stuff. I just, there's something about it that was really well done. And the, actually the worst part of the movie was Corey Feldman. The best part of the movie was the main guy and Kiefer Sutherland were the best parts of the movie. Kiefer Sutherland is the best part of the movie. You say, I like, mean, I've never seen it, so I don't know. I don't even know Kiefer's... how much. I, I've seen the cover and I've seen, you know, old Keefe yeah. on it. He, the reason why he's so good in the movie is because it shows that he, he was a good actor kind of pretty much the whole ride. Mm-hmm. Like he, he, he's, he's, uh, above, well above the other actors in the movie, well above. And, the Corey Feldman character, I 
the the initial misconception I had about this movie was that Corey Feldman was going to be the main focus of it because all I had heard about this era was Corey Feldman, Corey Haim, Corey Feldman, Corey Haim. All those fucking movies that they did, the million sequels to Lost Boys and all that shit. Mm -hmm. I had always thought, oh, Corey Feldman. No, he doesn't really, to me, play a very crucial role in the movie. The, the, move, the role he plays is very juvenile and really weird. He hmm. plays like a almost like borderline on the spectrum supposed vampire hunter kid and they they play him as like a uh they play him as a very like second banana um guy who's trying to do quips in a very serious way but none of them land oh nice like he's tried to do, do like action movie uh quips and they don't land very well because he's like trying to be tough trying to be like a tough boy I don't really know what their intention was with it. Uh, but again, the concept of the movie in a general sense is um, this guy moves to uh, California and runs into this streetwise gang of toughs. They ride around on their motorcycles and they're all sexy and, you know, the... The other thing is that what I found interesting about it was that the this is such a cliche thing to say, but it really is true in the case of this movie is that Los like Los Angeles plays the, plays a character. Mm -hmm. The um, setting of the movie is pretty much actually more important than a lot of the characters are. Really, just in a, in the sense of like it paints the picture so they don't have to. You see, like oh cool, they're down on the boardwalk, and oh cool, you know it's like other it's the beach and. Oh, cool. It's like the little the cave thing that they all live in. It's got that like um, it's a very Los Angeles vibe to it. It's got a very California vibe to it. Um, but that's something that I saw that I that I would think, you know, you would think I would have already seen. But it's also before my time. It doesn't really make sense for it. It would make more sense if it was like a movie from the 90s that I had never seen before, but this is yeah. like well before I was born. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're it, we're never it's really not terrible. Into that, those type of movies anyways, right? No, I like mean, I think I am now. Movie? I think yeah. I like it now. I, I I think I like it now because again, it, it's more of a look back. It's like, you, you like the movies that are coming out now that are the throwbacks, so you want to actually see the originals. And yeah, I kind of want to see where they're like coming the from. Pulling from. Yeah. yeah. And and me and I think it actually kind of led me down a path of wanting to explore more of those movies, like trying to see if there is some some of those classic films that I've always been kind of dubious about in especially in the 80s. Like I definitely want to watch like some Cronenberg, like that's one of the ones that's always been on my list is watch. Like I really the loved the fly. I love that. I actually have seen that multiple times. I've just never seen any of the rest of his movies like fucking video drum. I've always, no, no, that's, that's uh, David Lynch. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I have also always wanted to see a razor head. It always panicked me to see it because it, it sounds absolutely, uh, it's a fucking fever dream. Um, but uh, it's because I actually know I think I would like it because it's body horror, but mm -hmm. I've been getting a little bit more into that recently. OK, so here's another thing. You've seen it. Uh, it follows, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so as far as. um, Reading is concerned, I've been reading a lot more. Just got through a book about uh, quack medicine, which is fucking fascinating. Uh, highly recommend it. It's called Quackery. It's written by an internal medicine doctor. Like a duck. I actually read... What? Like a duck. Like a duck. Quackery like a duck. Uh, it's basically the idea of the book is... Remember back in 1927 when... The only cure you had for your pain was to take a heroin and call me in the morning. Uh, that's the whole concept of the book is exploring the godfathers of and mothers of m the earliest forms of medicine. 
like just after Witch Doctor, but just before DNA. Like we're we're we'll meet you in the middle. We're right in the we're right in the thick of it in in the turn of the century. It's you know again 1910, 1920. Doctors are trying to like balance some chakras they're trying to like they don't they don't know what makes the blood do what it does but maybe if we when left, you cut you it too much you got too much let a little bit of it out uh i'm not kidding you what you just said is exactly the rationale but it's behind a very popular bloodletting concept yeah in the 1910s which was like we knew we know about bloodletting but the but there was one doctor who was like th there were just as many doctors that said your blood is poisoned right yeah that's why you would let it out so that you create more blood yeah you get but the there bad, were just as you get the yeah bad you get oil. the bad blood you gotta it's an oil change you Give gotta get it out mm -hmm. sure it should work uh there were just as many doctors that thought it was poison blood as there were doctors that thought you had too much <laughs> and Th what they said was the reason was because if you had too much blood, that could cause disease because your organs would overflow. Like, like you, oh, you got too much blood in your body. That's why your liver's not working because there's too much blood in there. I mean, it's it, it's kind of true for why you have a headache, why you get a Dude. headache because you got your blood vessels do a dilate. No. Yes, dilate. And dilate, yeah. So they got, mm -hmm. you know, basically they got more blood going through them. So if you got a headache, you know, just get a little drill, just bzzz, let a little bit of yeah, that perfect. blood out. Yeah, Just like that, in the movie Pie, where he gives himself a lobotomy. Get a little, get a little bit of that blood out, then you're good to go. Boom. No headache. Uh, they talk about lobotomies in there. They talk about the holes in the head. They get into, like, uh, shock therapy, or is that... Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They they got into they got into shock therapy and they and what they do, which I think is really great for this type of book, because it's cool that it's like all of this shit where it's like interesting. But then also at the end of every chapter, they explain how they could have been correct in thinking what they thought mm -hmm. and just how they executed it wrong. So it's like shock therapy is one of those things that we modified to suit a better purpose later on down the road using the same technology or you know the bloodletting thing when we're talking about you know stuff like a blood transfusion yeah. there it, it all leads to a certain area but they it's but it's they all super wrong but their execution was a little you wouldn't hey, be what, able to write <laughs> what else you got a, a wire coming out the wall what, what else you gonna do with it <laughs> yeah like you couldn't have written that book you know, even 40 years later in the 60s and 70s and had people think, you know, uh, had people think, oh, Jesus, what were they doing back then? It could only be written now just based on how far it's come. The only reason why we're shocked from what we're hearing is because we're so fucking far removed from it and we're so far ahead of it. Thank yeah. God. Uh, but. It's not, it doesn't necessarily go in line with the theme of what you're talking about, which is a thing that I should have. It's mainly just a piece of media that I really liked. Um, I am, quit, though. Quit trying to tank my bit, Brent. Jesus. I'm not trying. I'm just grasping at straws. <laughs> uh, there is one thing that's kind of related to that, which is, um, have you ever heard of the author of Haruki Murakami? Maybe. He's a... He is a Japanese fiction writer okay. that has won a shit load of awards. He is one of the most prolific and sought after artists of literature you by in the modern age. Um, He's written A Wild Sheep Chase, Norwegian Wood, The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle, Kafka on the Shore, and IQ84, which is his most recent one. Kafka um, on the Shore. Sound. Kafka on the Shore. Uh, 
It was among the best books of 05 from the New York Times and received the World Fantasy Award for 06. Um, he, his writing, Dylan, I swear to God, is so fucking hard to read. Cool. Um, that sounds like fun. And, well, it's one of those things where, you know how, like, you know, um, James Joyce, like, uh, Ulysses, or, or um, what yeah. the hell is the other one? Uh, Infinite Jest, where it's like, the book is completely incomprehensible. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like that, but also the weird thing about it is that you you can read it. I, I can't, it's very hard for me to describe. The way that it reads is the guy is very Dickensian in how he describes everything. Everything has a, and then he walked over to the phone, picked up the receiver, put it to his ear hole. The sound came out of the line and into his ear. He then transcoded this mess. Like it has like that for me. Um, I guess I, and I don't, that's what I'm trying to understand. Sometimes it's more for me about trying to understand why something is the way that it is rather than what it is like. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't know if it maybe has something to do with the way that it's translated or if it's like, it could be, I, I mean, but the thing is though, Every time I look on my fucking Kindle, he's in all of the lists that say, like, oh, God, the best novels this year and, and shit like that. And, Did and you like, try to read one? Or yeah, no? I'm trying oh, to read one okay. right now. I, I'm trying to read, um, and I was literally, literally done. I was almost thinking about getting a fucking spark notes. <laughs> Like, like to try to, to try to like kind of understand. I mean, at that point, I just just stop reading the book. I'm if giving if it's so uninteresting that it uncaptivated, is it even interesting you at all? It it is. Let me. Like, is it I, stringing here, you stringing you along to try to like a story that you're interested in? I'm gonna give you the first paragraph of the plot summary because this actually is how far I've made it in the. In, in it. Okay. So. Which one is this? What book is it? This is the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. It's actually three books in one. Okay. I, uh, I, didn't, the know, first, I didn't know which one you were talking yeah. about. Yeah. The first one is called The Book of the Thieving Magpie. Nice. The first part, The Thieving Magpie, begins with the narrator, Toru Okada, a low-key and unemployed lawyer's assistant, being tasked by his wife, Kumiko, to find their missing cat. Kumiko suggests looking in the alley, a closed-off strip of land behind their house. After Toru stays there for a while with no luck, Mei Kasahara, a teenager who had been watching him camping out in the alley for some time, questions him. She invites him over to her house in order to sit on the patio and look over an abandoned house that she says is a popular hangout for stray cats. The abandoned house is revealed to possibly contain some strange omen as it had brought about bad luck to all of its prior tenants. It also contains an empty well, which Toru uses later to crawl into and think. This is where you're, this is where I'm, and this is the weirdest cut in a plot line you'll ever hear in your life. Toru then receives sexual phone calls from a woman who says she knows him. He also receives a phone call from Malta Cano who asks to meet with him, who is a clairvoyant. So, okay, so he got the ghost in him when he went to the well. I don't know, but just <laughs> to give you an idea of how so like I I read you the first like real big beats in this plot. The sexual phone calls part is actually interstitial in the whole thing. It's basically like he's like walking around the house thinking about how the fuck he's going to find this cat. He gets a phone call. He picks up the phone. The lady's like, you know, at first isn't innately sexual, but almost in the tone of the book, it kind of takes on a phone sex operator type voice. Like, mm -hmm. 
they try to explain it as like a mm, call now type of voice. So like immediately you're like, oh, it, it's but it also doesn't have anything to do with anything. I as a plot point, it's it, it's basically juxtaposing this guy is incredibly mundane search for this cat with the occasional call he gets from some random ass woman that he's never heard of and doesn't know who can actually personally identify him making sexual advances over the phone. So I, I I don't know. Like there's a lot of shit. This plot is really big. Um, Okay. Don't ruin it for me. Maybe I'll give it a try. No, I mean, look, I think that like a lot of it is a lot of it is thematic Mm -hmm. and a lot of it is presented in a way of it being very um, character driven. They want you to see the characters. They want you to like understand them. They don't really necessarily need you to know about the plot. They kind of just want you to be like, ooh, does that mean something? At least that's from my initial... Um, and that's what it sounds like. It's like the phone but sex the things, other th- It's like, am I supposed to think it means something? I'm hoping so. Otherwise, what's the point of this? Yeah, and not, not only that, but I think also... Or this has got to play into a, something else later on down the line. Just reading his biography, like in general, just for his style, like he, his, it's all endemic of the Japanese sensibility of having a character that is a trait. So, like, this says any main character who is independent becomes a man who values freedom and solitude over intimacy. So it's like he. Another notable feature of Murakami's stories are the comments that come from the main characters as to how strange the story presents itself. Murakami explains that his characters experience what he experiences as he writes which can be compared to a movie set where the walls and props are all fake. So like there's like some weird third wall, fourth wall shit going on here. There's some like, um, they said that he also like has aspects of like shamanism in his writing and Japanese folk religion. It all connects to something that sounds like something I should really like. Yeah. Where it's like a guy writing a story. That's very, um, I mean, but, it, 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 it does, but you also don't have connection to, like, those Japanese... Yeah, I think it's so centralized. Yeah, It's like almost like, like uh, playing through Sekiro, like, it plays out it's a like, lot of... It's like, how the ja- fuck am I supposed to understand this? It plays out this? a lot of, like, <laughs> Japanese folklore and, like, stuff like that, but, like, if I you have no connection to it, it just seems like... How the like hell am I supposed to... Odd nonsense. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing, is that, like... He, you know, in the in the general thing about the book that I'm reading is basically um, the the way that they're describing it is very war. Like it it actually kind of has a Ghibli thing to it. You know how the subtext in a lot of Ghibli films is the backdrop of of Jap of war. Mm-hmm. like you yeah. know the wind rises and shit like that that all has that that sort of background and it's all some of it's also deeply apocalyptic but i think that's the other thing here is that like one of these things is like um he spends most of their sessions retelling the same story of his experience in the Kwantung army and the lost bank ba- tank battle with the russians at nomen han and the manchuoko russian border during world war ii it's like yeah it's a character study but you also you know, they talk about a lot of shit. There's a lot of characters. It's a whole thing. Um, but anyway, that more feeds into the segment idea because Murakami, I had just seen so many times and I was like, wh- why am I move? What is so special about this guy? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'd like to give it a chance to really try to like, it's one of those things where you just see something as a challenge because you, I don't know. 
books. Sometimes books are a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> I mean they got it. Like otherwise, I mean they don't have to. I mean, look, I could just I could just read Ready Player One until I fucking die. But what, what, uh, what was that one book you said? What was the name of it? The Wind Up Bird Chronicle no, was no, the one like that the I read. Oh, the, there's a later. Oh, one. IQ eighty four was the most the recent one. one. That. That's the one that he uh, Kafka on the shore. Kafka. Kafka, like Franz Kafka. Oh, okay. Metamorphosis I Kafka. I thought you said Kefka, and I was wondering where I heard that name. It's because it's the the boss in uh, what is it? Final Fantasy six or three? Three? Which... <laughs> yeah, it, he he's a clown, the clown boss. He's a clown. He's a yeah, fucking clown. clown. Yeah, what a clown! No, he's literally a, a clown. <laughs> he's a fucking clown. <laughs> 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 what a clown I was, I was wondering where i heard the word kafka before like why that title sounded familiar and then that's probably why i don't think i actually heard of the of the book sorry uh <laughs> i i feel like this guy likes cats there's another thing that's that's kind of in there somewhere um IQ 84 was also, it sounded really interesting. I just thought that I would want to read like the one that was more, uh, um, that was, that was like one of his more original classics, like one of the better ones. Mm -hmm. But like this one actually sounds pretty fucking cool. Um, he said that the reference is, is to George Orwell's 1984. Um, it was basically a like technologically forward thing, which probably would have appealed to me better. Anyway, <laughs> uh, fucking a. Right, just read uh, about this guy's lost cat, I guess. Well, there. So here's the next thing. Uh, Junji Ito. Um, which is weird because I I don't know how the hell this came back into my life. I can't quite remember, mm -hmm. but I've always been a really big fan of his. Um, ever since I saw the um the his one of his original comics was on Reddit. He is a uh, a Japanese uh, horror body horror uh, comic comic artist. Um, the Amagara Fault was the was the first comic that I had ever read by him it was called the enigma of the amagara fault uh it's absolutely terrifying um what it's about in general is a uh basically in after an earthquake in japan a giant fault is discovered on amagara mountain which is like very close to where the epicenter of the earthquake was mm -hmm. and on the slopes of the mountain there was two hikers that found the fault but they don't like they they have this weird like connection to it somehow and then they they look at the side of the mountain and they see millions of human shaped holes in the side of the mountain huh. and people start to have dreams about it after it happened and now suddenly there are hundreds of people making a pilgrimage to it as if they're compelled by like some insane force. Like it's like unstoppable an unstoppable force. And then they basically like a news, a news crew shows up on the scene because a guy found his hole. He took off all of his clothes, he crawled into the hole, and he was never seen again. And that's why the news crew was there, because the guy disappeared. Now, the, the other thing is that now, several months later, after multiple people have, been, have disappeared into the cracks in the side of this fault in these human-shaped holes, they find out that on the other side of the mountain, there are more faults, and they're narrower. So what has happened is that on the other side of the fault, you see an incredibly disturbing image of a man who has been spaghettified by being pushed into the fault 
and he basically stretches out into Ooh. oblivion. So that's the body horror part, obviously. Uh, there is another. So Adult Swim is actually adapting uh, another one of Junji Ito's stories to a physical anime, which I'm very much looking forward to. It looks absolutely fucked up. It's super disturbing. Uh, but speaking of cats, Junji Ito also did a uh, did a manga about his cats, <laughs> which is really good and it's like five bucks if you uh if you ever want to look into it uh it's a complete departure for him it's a comedy thing How do you spell it's it? about him and his wife getting cats uh j-u-n-j-i i-t-o junji ito oh junji's his first name ito. yeah junji yeah um so like a lot of his stories involve the idea that like kind of people want to destroy themselves. Like that's kind of the Amagara fault concept. Um, and then also about like uh, external um, external forces that you cannot control. Like the whole Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Um, no. What's, yeah, what's yeah, that that's it? it. That's it. I'm looking at it right now. Tommy's one of them, but then there's the one about the spirals. That's the one that I really oh, want to uh, uh, Uzumaki. Uzumaki, yeah. That, so that's the one that they're adapting into the cartoon, where the whole town is obsessed with these fucking spirals that show up in their town, which to me is like really cool. Sounds very Twin Peaks. Like it's it's very like strange. Um, Yeah, she uh the the Tomi one was the other one that I really want to see. Uh ba -ba 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 -ba. but yeah, Junji Ito is disturbing. His work has inspired a lot of people uh in the horror community. And I think the guy just deserves a lot a lot of credit uh for the for the type of shit he's doing. Uh so yeah. Got I'm like I love the art Sick. of Junji. Uh, use a Mackey. Oh, dude. Uh, they did a, um, there was a, there was a clothing, uh, collab, um, that some company did. Now I'm trying to remember who it was, but they had the, uh, they had that front, the Uzumaki, uh, front cover there with the girl with the spiral bore through her face. Mm hmm. They had that on the front of a shirt, and I was oh. like, oh, yeah, baby. That's the stuff. <laughs> That's the one I want. Give it to me nice and slow. <laughs> dude, the fucking, uh, the looks that you would get when you wear a shirt like that, dude. Oh, my God. Um, actually, there's some ones at Hot Topic, <laughs> funnily enough. Uh, not that one. There is a, um, there is an Uzumaki uh, shirt, but it's a girl's shirt. And it's actually one that you could wear. It's not disturbing, uh, but it's it, but it is like real fucking cool. Yeah, I just really, really like that his work. I was talking uh, about the the Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind uh, mangas. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the, that's that was a manga to start out with. Yes. Or no? Oh really? Yes. Uh. uh... I've like, oh, you know what else I want to read, Dylan? Really bad, you know. Obviously, um, I'm a big fan of um, um, Brian Lee O'Malley, mm -hmm. the guy who wrote Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, he just came out with a new novel called uh, Snot Girl. Oh, I've. Did That's... you see that? That's on the Humble Bundle, by the way. Um, if you were interested in, how new is it? It's real new. It just came out on Image Comics. It must be the collection then. Uh, ba -na 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 -ba -ba um, yeah, number uh, one. Uh, we're at number one through three are the current collections. Yeah, because uh, I've heard of it a while ago. I heard of it. Yeah, the the individ. Uh, yeah, obviously the individuals were coming out. I never see any of the individual stuff 
like I only ever see ads for collections. Like if if I'm even looking at stuff like that. Well, that's um, I mean that's because they want to sell that. Well, right. I mean, well, no, it's you're not gonna like a lot of times. I don't know. It just seems harder. That they don't really show or uh, advertise like single issues. For yeah. Really any comic. When have yeah, you when have you seen any co- like a a commercial for any comic? A lot of times it's just like a press release. Like, I mean, the only way that I saw writing, like this person's right in this series come out, and then yeah, the uh, the only um, the only reason why I saw it was because I saw an ad for it on Instagram. Was that the was it the volume one had come out? And then, then I see this humble bundle for Image Comics, and I was like, I know Image has some shit that I really like on it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're kind of like my type of like graphic novel uh, production company, and so like I wanted to, I got the humble bundle. I want, I'm going to read Snot Girl, and then there was a, the other one was uh, I wanted to read was shit, uh, Blackbird. Um. Yeah, that was. I wanted to read Blackbird, and I wanted to read that one, and then there was one other one, uh, from somebody that I really liked. Shit. Well, and then so there's another book that I also wanted to read that was actually done by Sarah Beatty, uh, called um, Money Shot, which was about a group of uh, space pilots that decide that they're not making enough money doing what they're doing so they're going to start a porno company and they all had they all shoot porno films on different planets that they travel to and post them online oh <laughs> so i thought that was uh i thought that was a cool concept for a book i still haven't even like i st- i want to still read saga like jesus christ well, I-, I i bought what do i have i have one, two, and three, maybe that I read. Through. Yeah, I think I got like one and two, possibly. I, um, I, I, I really like three. Brian I, Brian K. Vaughn like a lot. Uh, I just really like the concept of that story. I don't even know what else he's written. Uh, Paper Girls. Oh yeah, shit. He was doing um, something else too with why he stopped doing saga. Uh oh, why the last man? That oh, was another one, yeah, dude. That was, that was the That's one of those ones that always comes one. up on those lists where it's like these this is one of the best comics ever written. Oh, uh, that was on Vertigo. Um Why the Last Man and then he did Saga and then he yeah, he get Paper Girls. That was definitely one I want to see. Um yeah, that's about it for him. As far as like, I mean, he did a lot of shit for Marvel. Um, nothing really of like incredible note. He did some runaway one shots. Um, but yeah, you know, nerd shit. You know what I'm saying? Like real, real hardcore nerd shit. Yeah, I don't even know how you got on this. I got on it because when you were asking me about media that I was consuming, then kind of one thing led to another. Oh, okay. And and that was it's basically me talking about all the things that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I'm getting into gouache painting now, Dylan. I mean, I, I don't know what that is. Gouache is like a cross between acrylics and watercolors. It comes in like a very thick medium like an acrylic paint but you can water it down just like you could watercolors i like water watercolors like the coolest well the cool thing about gouache is that normally with watercolors you can only get to a certain level of saturation before it's like well i can't make this any darker or more opaque there's Uh, my paper yeah with gouache you can do a light what like so you can water it down like a piston and it'd be like a watercolor you do a light wash over the whole thing but then you can take more of the medium mix it in there and now it's an actual paintable opaque medium that can go straight over the top of the thin layer and anywhere in between so you can go from ultra thick wash all the way up to full illustration like really solid 
paint strokes. Cool. Yeah. I bought this, um... You know, you ever get excited about buying art shit? You ever do that? Mm -hmm. New pens? Mm -hmm. I got this set from Japan. It's from a company called Mia. It's Himi. Himi Gouache. Okay. And it's in this cool carry case. Yep. And all of them come in little pods that you take up the lid off of. And then in the lid of it, there is a detachable mixing tray that comes right out. Oh. And an additional pallet area for mixing. Fancy. Uh, it was freaking 15 or 20 bucks on Amazon. Got great reviews from people that somehow are in the know on a lane of YouTube that I've never gotten into in my life before, which is just people speed painting with gouache. Uh, and then I got some bomb ass brushes from Transon, some synthetic brushes. And a big ass pad of mixed media. This is the exciting part, Dylan. Just the possibilities. You know what I'm saying? A white piece of paper, a big thick white piece of paper. Is what there got, anything better than what that? What you got drawn in there, huh? Nothing. <laughs> How long have you had it for? Ah, uh, since Wednesday. Oh, okay. Last Wednesday. Yeah. I'm not. No, I look. I'll tell you this. The inner monologue that I have in my mind about this, Dylan. I, I already know. I was just, I was just joking. No, I want to say this because... I'm going to be a fucking professional at this. The second I touch this brush to this pad, it's going to look like every video I watched on YouTube. I think almost, Dylan, I'll be 30 in September. And I know now that I think five six seven years ago that would have been what i would have thought what i would have thought in my head was i would have been so excited to get this these new materials into my incredibly talented and capable hands and that the the art will flow so effortlessly from me that it will be unable to be controlled but the truth the real truth of the matter is I have crippling anxiety that the minute that I pick up this paintbrush, it will look like a five-year-old's watercolor painting because I have no foundational reference for art. So instead, pretty I'm much at all, buy all the stuff to do it, and then just keep pushing it off. Yep. I just keep looking at it, thinking Brad, about it. I'll t- you can't yeah. be bad if you never do it. Dude, but it's right there. Come on, man. It's right come there. On, so man. when when you want to make something real good, you got it right there. But at this point, I'm not bad at it. I'm the best. How could you be bad at something you don't do? How, you know, I feel like I I feel like it's very intimidating. I don't know why physical media is so fucking intimidating because it has a finality here let me give you a little words of wisdom pick up that pick up that pad uh pad right now yep here it is you have every sheet in there to make a mistake on how many mistakes is that brent all right let's take a look here on the front of this it says 15 sheets let's say it's front back right i don't know let's say you probably wouldn't do front back. Ah, uh, uh, mixed water. media. It's it's but pretty you're thick. using water. Uh yeah. I mean, you can stretch it. You can stretch the paper, and like it'll it'll kind of come back to its own. But okay, let's just say so, it's fifteen. So so okay. So you have one book, and you can make fifteen pieces of trash in there. Guess what? Mm-hmm. You can go to the store and buy another book. No mistakes in it at all. You could do it all over again. Wow. Thanks, Tony Robbins. I got you. I have never, I mean, truly, and, and, and no bullshit, that is fucking the best way to end this fucking thing that I've ever heard in my life. To any of you out there in the fucking ether, from hundred, hundreds of years from now, when somebody can hear my voice, other than the five people that listen to this podcast right now, I just want to tell you that if you 
are scared that you're going to fuck up your 15 sheets of paper, there's another 15 sheets of paper at Michael's waiting for you to not fuck up. That's so you've inspired me, Dylan. I am going to this week. I am going to paint something in this fucking stupid thing. Whatever it is, I'm going to show it on next week's podcast. Whatever. I don't care what it is. I'm just going to it. If it's an abstract thing, just for me to get the sense of what the medium's like. Perfect. If it's a thing that I actually try to plan out and do, and it turns out horribly, even better. We're going to, we're going to go to the fucking loony bin together. I got a better idea. Show you. Go for it. You do that. And do you have a scanner? Yep. Scan it, and then we'll use it as the background for the stream next week. Yep. Let's do this thing. It's going to look like some Yoshi's Painted World or whatever the fuck that paint game is. <laughs> look like a piece of shit five-year-old. Well, I'll probably play SpongeBob again, so maybe use... You know what I'll do, Dylan? All you, right, use, so here's what we'll do. Use the art uh, direction of SpongeBob as your... Yeah, I can make it as like a. I can use it as reference material. Yeah, I'll get like some floral stuff going on. I'll get some beachy shit, some underwater. We'll get going on that. All right, my challenge has been accepted. For for next week's stream, I'm going to paint. I'm going to paint the background for the stream. <laughs> Okay. Well, Dylan, it's been an absolute pleasure, but I have to go digest this absolutely in indigestion causing food uh in the comfort of my living room. So I will leave you with the audio versions of this podcast are available in the description below. Dylan will edit both of these pieces together. And this will sound like a whole podcast. This has been the Jacket Off podcast. We're out. Oh, the answer to my part of my bit that I had was Spaceballs. Bye. <laughs>